She didn't drink enough coffee. Chapter 10, verse 17. We're going to look at that. Uh, what I see in this verse, uh, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So in my mind, it's important to hear what God has said, right? And it's important to believe what God has said, okay? Not just in one area of the Bible, but in all areas of the Bible. It's extremely important. So our message today is based on what we believe. And we take what we believe out of the Bible, but we don't just take what we believe out of the Bible. We take what we believe out of the Bible dispensationally. And people dislike that word. They, they, add a, they add a prefix to it and they say hyper dispensationalist to scare you away from the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Hyper dispensationalist. And that's only because you disagree with their religion or their theology. Yeah. So they've got to label you something to keep people from coming to you, okay? And coming to the truth. So for instance, a guy would call us hyper dispensationalists because we don't start the church, the body of Christ, in Acts chapter 2, right? We believe that the church, the body of Christ, got started when the Apostle Paul was saved, that he was the first member into the body of Christ. Now, we didn't make that up. That's not something we got together and said, let's vote on that. You simply would turn to 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, and you would see that, right? In me first, you know? So that's why we believe it. But the first deal we want, to, we want to look at, and the first point, we want to look at salvation. Salvation, believe it or not, is a dispensational issue. People say, well, people have always been saved, always, from the beginning to the end, they've always been saved the same way. They've been saved the same way. Well, you can't find the same message throughout all the Bible, can you? Can you go back to Abraham and see where God said, Abraham believed that Christ has died for your sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and raised again the third day according to... Now, if you believe that, Abraham, you're saved. Did you ever find that in the Bible? No. What was Abraham told to do? Get away from the Gentile nation, right? Believe God, and it was counted to him for righteous. It had nothing to do with him telling him about the cross and all that, right? So salvation is a dispensational issue. When we go back to the four Gospels, we don't find Christ telling anybody, we don't find Peter, any of those guys telling people to believe that Christ had died for their sins, was buried and rose again, it was hid from them. We've all seen that. So is there any way possible that it's always been the same message that saved people throughout all, all ages? No, it's not possible. He told Noah to build an ark. Right? There were people over there offering up animal sacrifices for their sins. So salvation is not the same throughout all dispensations. Paul was given a distinct and a different message for salvation, a gospel that before Paul had not been preached, right? And so what we believe about this gospel that Paul received, that he delivered unto us, is that Christ died, was buried, and he rose again, the third day, to justify all men, right? That message was not available until Paul told it. Now, you can piecemeal anything, right? I can go over here and pinch out a little bit of this in Acts or over here in the Gospels, and then I can couple it up with what Paul's doing. I can say, see, it's all the same, but no, it's not, right? Don't do that. Don't do that with the Bible. Don't, don't ever just take and pluck up stuff and put it into a place God don't have it, right? That's called spiritual blindness. That's how people get confused, all right? God has separated things, divided things, just like when he began in Genesis 1, he divided some things. In his word, he's divided some stuff. So the salvation that we believe, and Paul delivers that gospel to us how we are saved, folks, it doesn't get anything attached to it. It doesn't get water baptism. It doesn't get circumcision. It doesn't get good works. It gets nothing out of your nasty flesh. Right? It's given to us as a gift when we believe what God said about His Son and His completed cross work. That's when we receive that salvation. 
We receive it. We receive it without a covenant. We receive it without a nation above us. We receive it. We're not under the old covenant. We're not under the new covenant. We're under God's unadulterated grace. The law is in both covenants, old and new. We're not under law, but we're under grace. Now most people, and you are blessed, right? We're blessed to hear the gospel without any strings attached every week here. We're blessed. Man, you ought to praise God for that. Somebody has taken the time to tell you how to go to heaven when you die. And it has nothing to do with you getting prettier, you getting better, you getting lovely, you getting smelly. It has nothing to do with any of that. What it has to do with is your Savior said, I'll die for you while you're yet a sinner. I'll die for you while you're yet ungodly. I'll die for you while you're yet an enemy. I'll die, raise again the third day. And if you'll put your trust in my finished cross work, you can be saved. That's not the message that gets preached around, folks. There's always some, if they don't load it up with works at the front of the deal, they'll come in the back and load it up with works. Right? Your standing in Christ is sure when you get saved. You know, people want to say, well, you can lose it. Then that means you've got something to do with it. That means if you believe you can lose your salvation, you do not fully trust what God said about Jesus Christ and all that He did to complete you. You're believing there's something out of yourself that you can do. You believe there's something that you are doing. And if you, if you quit doing it, then you're going to lose your salvation. If you start doing it, you're going to lose your salvation. Can I tell you that salvation and the dispensation of the grace of God is a done deal. And it's done because it's based on what He did. Folks, I'm not going to turn from that. You can go back there and get Peter's gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the circumcision, and you can play around with that all you want. I'm going to try to bring people to Christ through what Christ did on the cross, the power of the gospel to save all who will believe it. The preaching of the cross. Amen? That's what we believe about salvation. Look at 1 Corinthians. You know, the idea that God gave you a free gift, and then right behind it, He said, now here's a payment book, keep up with the payments. That's not a free gift. Right? Stimulus check ain't a gift, folks. That's coming out of your taxes. They just returned to you what you'd already given. And didn't give you a fraction of it. Look at my paycheck sometimes. If you want a stimulus check, give me back what I gave you the last 12 months. That'll stimulate me. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) Let's be real. Y'all want to see somebody spend some money? Give it back to me. All right, look here at 15 and 1, 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, but which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. So Paul received this gospel. He received this message, right? How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now that sounds impossible for a man in the flesh to say, that's all I have to do. But that's the truth. That's the truth. All I have to do is say God is right. God is true. God made it clear that His Son died for my sins. Past, present, future. He didn't leave any of them undone. He didn't say, Donnie, I saved you from all your sins. Now get you a basket and start counting them up. And when you get about halfway full, come and put them before me. Not what he did. He put them out of the way. He blotted them out. They're gone. Gone. (laughs) Never ever to be charged to me again. Right? You with me? God did that. Not through your praying. He did that through that man. He took your sin. He gave you his righteousness. 
Amen? Amen. You with me? Yeah. That's what we believe about salvation. Yeah. Everybody preached that throughout the whole Bible. No. no. Look at Galatians chapter 1. I was going to go faster with this the way I was going to do it earlier, but y'all stay with me. I'm going to let you participate, I promise. Watch this. How can this man make this statement? How can he make this statement if this gospel was always in existence? How can he make this statement? And listen, it's not Paul speaking. It's the Holy Ghost inspiring Paul to write God's Word, right? Look here at 111. But I certify you, brother. And that's like saying I, when we certify a car at work, we're putting a guarantee on that car. We're certifying it for a, a, particular, a, a particular cause we're certifying. It, right? He said, I certify you, brethren. I never thought my teaching would be so good that people would bring popcorn and eat it. It's what you do with a movie, man. I try not to get proud, but that's good stuff. People come, listen to me teach, and bring popcorn and eat it. Hallelujah. Watch this, watch this here, 111. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. Watch this. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Can you see that? Paul just said, nobody sat me down and said, Paul, here's the gospel. This is what you're going to preach. This is what we've been preaching ever since the Bible started, Paul. This is what we were preaching in the four Gospels, Paul. Listen to us. Here's the way the Gospel goes. Paul just said that didn't happen. Paul said that Jesus Christ appeared to him by revelation, and he gave Paul this Gospel. Right? Can I believe the Scripture? Yeah. What was the first verse we read? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you say, I don't believe that, you know what you have a lack of? Faith in what God said. That's what God said. He gave Paul that gospel. Right? right? Now, here's the thing about the gospel. The mystery of the gospel was never Christ dying on the cross, being buried and raised again. That's known throughout the books. The mystery of it was, He did it for you and I, without Israel, the Bible and even Satan knew that Christ was going to die for the sins of the people over there being Israel. But he did not know that God was going to fill up the heavens and take away his throne room with a church, the body of Christ, by people who would just believe what God gave the Apostle Paul. That's the mystery of the gospel. He died for my sin, your sin, who were not a people. Amen? You with me? If you'd have got saved under that old economy, it would have had to have been through Israel's gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the one they're all preaching today. Right? So salvation is clear, crystal clear. One brother said, I like my gospel clear. Don't put anything in it. All it is is Christ, Him dying, Him shedding His blood, Him being raised again the third day. It has nothing to do with my stinking flesh or yours or the polished preacher, Right? All right, so we'll look at that. Anybody got another one you'd like? What we believe. Right? Wouldn't it be good to know who, 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 what? That Paul's our apostle. Well, boy, that's a, that's a revelation, isn't it? <laughs> hey, Paul is the, the, the apostle of who? The world. The world. Matthew says the blood of the New Testament was shed for many. Paul said he was given a ransom for all. There's further revelation given unto the Apostle Paul. God gave the law to Moses to dispense the law to the children of Israel. God gave Paul the grace message to dispense to the entire world. That now the righteousness without the law was made manifest, right? Can you, can you see that? It's amazing that the law in Moses offends nobody. But Paul and grace just tears the wheels right off their wagon. That's crazy, isn't it? So what do we believe? We believe that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Why do we believe that? Go to Romans chapter 15. We probably don't get as far as I thought maybe we might with this, but we'll, we'll get enough they'll know what we believe. <laughs> right? Romans chapter 15.
verse 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Paul is who? The minister of whom? The Gentiles. You see, notice he, he, doesn't, he doesn't say there, I'm the minister to the Gentiles. He says, I'm the minister of the Gentiles. I can be a friend to you without being a friend of you. If you have a flat tire out here today, I pull over, not knowing who you are, get out, jack the car up, replace the tire, that would be a friend to you. But if I'm a friend of you, that means I've got something in common with you, right? It's, it's, a, it's a closer thing, right? It's something more personal, a friend of somebody, okay? So Paul says he's the minister of the, the, uh, the Gentiles. So we believe that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I believe what God said when He said that Paul is the minister of the... I believe that. Look over in Acts chapter 9. There's people who want to grow their faith. And that growing of faith is something that they've gotten taught in the religious circles to be able to do more stuff, grow your faith. Yeah. I want to grow in the faith, right? Faith and, and grace are not going to grow. We need to grow in them. We need to grow in the faith and we need to grow in grace, okay? So I believe God when He says this. Look in uh, 9 and 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, speaking of Paul, Saul of Tarsus here, chose, he's a chosen best one of me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Everybody. Paul's going to take it out to everybody. Right? He's got the message for the world. Why did God need Paul? He already had 12. He must have a different plan with Paul. He must have, when all the prophets back here never prophesied of Jesus Christ returning to visit with this man Saul, Paul, they never prophesied of that. They prophesied of him coming over here to a nation being born. They prophesied of him coming back over here, setting up a throne in the earth. They didn't prophesy him returning to Paul. You know why? Because it's not in prophecy. Right? You know what makes us really different? We believe the Bible. <laughs> That's what makes us different. It's not that we're some cult. It's not that we got hit in the head with a bolt of lightning and we don't know where we're at. What it is, we believe the Bible. We don't try to make Paul part of the twelve where God's going to reconcile the earth unto himself. We take God at his word that Paul had a heavenly ministry to a heavenly body of people without a nation, one body in Christ going to heaven one day. Right? We believe, we believe that. We know why God chose Paul. It wasn't to continue what Peter and them were doing. That's what they teach you. Well, he just can't. Why? Why wouldn't Peter do it? He got the message up on the mount. Why wouldn't he do it? So we believe that the Apostle Paul is the Apostle of the Gentiles. And we believe that the 13 books that he wrote are the doctrine to the church, the body of Christ, concerning our salvation and our destination. That makes us weird. But that's what the Bible says. See, we're not just biblical here, we're also dispensational. We're hyper. My hind leg. Anybody got anything else that you believe? There's no divisions in the body of Christ. That would be this. One new man. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. When you come to this one new man and you label him Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, all that, you're trying to create a division in the body. Get rid of it. You're one new man. You don't have a denominational slogan or tag that you can claim. That's made of man. This man, the one new man, is something that Christ did. 
And it doesn't come with some special badge that you put on your church door that says, I'm this or I'm that, right? Look in chapter 2. Look in 14. For he is our peace unto, uh, who hath made both what? One. In the dispensation of the grace of God, everybody is down here and you got this thing called sin, right? All have been concluded under sin that he might have mercy on us all. There's no special person. There's no special group, no special nation. We're all down here in the same boat. What we need is salvation. We get that through Paul's gospel, right? And the moment we get that gospel and we believe it and we trust what Christ did in him alone, then we get the idea and we get the understanding of what he's got here in 2 and 14. He is our peace, he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down that middle wall of partition between us. There's no longer a nation up here and we're down here. He took all that out of the way. What? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man. So he took Israel, he took the Gentiles, took all the stuff out of the way that kept them separate, and he made them all one. And today, what God is doing, he's not building a nation. He's not building a kingdom with a nation. He's building a body. And the body of Christ can't start until you have Israel fallen. Because as long as you have risen Israel, you've got the middle wall of partition. That's why the Bible is clear that the, that the body of Christ cannot start until Paul receives his revelation. So, during the dispensation of the grace of God in which we live today, there's no special nation. That makes people mad. But there's not. Right? They're no better than you are. You're no better than they are. You're all sinners to the flesh needing a Savior. And Paul gave you the gospel to be saved by. Right? So, one new man. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You weren't made a part of something that was before Paul. You're something brand new that God had kept secret in himself before the world was and gave the revelation of the mystery to Paul how that now he can save all men on the merits of Jesus Christ and his blood without a covenant, without a nation, without anything that we can do, without law or any of that. So what are you under? Grace. You with me? That's what we believe. That's exactly what we believe. You know why we believe it? Because of Romans 6 and 14 says so. Right? Why? Right, what else do we believe? I'm sorry? Sealed by the Spirit. Yeah, we believe we're filled by the Spirit. We believe that a little bit differently because the Bible says differently, right? They were filled by the Spirit at Pentecost. I said sealed. sealed by the Spirit. Okay, well that's, that's a good one. Yeah, look at 4.30 of Ephesians. Excuse me, Randy, I'm sorry. Randy says we're sealed by the Spirit. I thought he said we we're filled by the Spirit. <laughs> yeah, we got, we're going to touch that one. I thought maybe he was getting ready to speak in tongues or something. <laughs> Said, we couldn't sidebar, Randy. Stay with it. Look here, 430. Agree not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. How long? Day of well, that's till you mess up. No. That's till you get off track. No. no, he says until the day of redemption. What does it mean when he says redemption? To, to this body's redeemed. Yeah. Right? Till we have that body likened unto his heavenly body until the day that this old flesh is done away with. It, we spend so much time fixing this up, don't we? I mean, we do the work on this old shell, man, just to leave it behind one day. Right? We put all types of stuff on it. All types of stuff trying to dress it up. And God says, that's okay, but you can't bring that with you. Right? We're going to get a redeemed body. So we're sealed. We are, that's right, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We're put in the cross and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's why, you know, people who do not believe in eternal security, you know, they'll jump on that. Once saved, always saved. Well, amen. Yeah. The reason you don't want that is because you can't handle the fact that Jesus did it all. You can't handle the fact that it's all by grace. There's nothing you can do. You think in your mind that you're doing something to keep up God's salvation plan. And that's erroneous. That's damnable, right? And when you don't understand eternal security, you don't understand the Bible. 
Right? You don't understand what was taught by the apostle that God gave you. So we're sealed by the Spirit. We believe that. We're not going to hide from that. If you ask me how long a person is saved, I'm going to tell you he's saved eternally because eternal life means what? Eternal life. All right? Look at 1 Corinthians. Willie hit it. We'll look at that baptism. What do we believe about baptism? Here's where we take a lot of heat, boys. But here's where we could have saved them on the water bill. Amen? They fill up them big old tanks of water, get them back there and duck them in water. Now they're a new creature. Now you're just a wet creature now. You become a new creature when you get placed into Christ. You don't get in Christ by dump, jumping in water. You get in Christ by believing the gospel. Chapter 12, verse 12. For as the body is one, and have many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one. Now here's the body talk, right? One body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into that one body. That's clear, isn't it? Now watch. It ain't about a nation. He said it ain't about where you come from. He said it's whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink what? Into that one Spirit. Look at Ephesians 4. There's your baptism that don't get preached correctly. Don't get taught correctly. Look at Ephesians in chapter 4. Verse 4. There's one body. The 1 Corinthians 12 just agreed with that, didn't it? And one spirit. Even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith. How many baptisms? One, one baptism. So we believe in one baptism. Well, y'all cult because you don't water baptize people. No, you're an offense to the cross because you do baptize people. Right? We believe what the book just said. We believe what he just said to the body of Christ. He used body over and over again. I challenge anybody watching the video, go outside of Paul's writings and pick up on somebody using the word body and one body over and over again. No, what you'll find is nation, nation, right? You're not going to find the body talk till you come to Paul. The first time you'll see the body talk is in Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. And who wrote Romans? Paul. Well, I wonder who got the revelation about the, the body. Paul. Paul did. You know, the one that's been ignored. Yeah. Right? Because we're all going to be one thing over here. We're going to go back, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and get our doctrine so we can be like Israel. Because why? Israel gets those physical blessings. Yeah. I did good this week, so I'm going to get something new. Right? Well, I've got it all, folks. <laughs> That's my next point. Water baptism has no place in the dispensation of the grace of God, and I'll not bow from that. I've heard dispensational preachers and teachers say, well, I'm okay if somebody wants to be water baptized. Well, you're just denying the verses. You're ashamed to sit and say that it's not right, that what God said, that it's not needed, it's not no place for it. He said there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism by one spirit, and we've all been baptized into one body. Why don't you just believe the scripture and quit doing it? Amen? You might have to call yourself by a different name now. Right? You might put something else over the door, but why don't you just be real with the Bible and believe it? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Do you got the faith? Do you have the faith to sit and say, I believe that verse? Amen. I do. Do I have the faith to believe that there's no water in the baptism that we get? I do. I'm not going to coward from that. I don't care what guy who can't let go of his religion wants to keep water in the church, the body of Christ. I'm done, man. I'm not going there with you. Water baptism and baptism by the Spirit to me is as clear as justification. I'll believe a justification verse in Romans, but I won't believe that verse in, in the book of Ephesians. Why not? Because there's something I'm holding on to. or something I'm afraid to let go of in the past. I don't want to offend somebody because I talk about their water. I don't want to offend you either. But if the Word of God offends you, right there it says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And he's already told you what the baptism was. So let it go. Right? All right. Amen. Christ did not send Paul to baptize, but to do what? 
So what does that tell you Paul's gospel don't have in it? Water baptism. What was Paul concerned about? What did the Holy Ghost tell him? Well, look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Well, that means primarily he had guys with him baptized. Well, come on, man. Why don't you just write you your own book? You criticize everybody else for it and do the same thing. You know what I found out with the Bible? There's not many Bible believers. There's a lot of Bible changers. When it goes against what we're doing in our church, then we're not going to believe the Bible. We're going to change the Bible. We well, used to a lot easier just believe the Bible. There again, cold day, you ain't got to worry about getting in the water. Amen? Look here at 1, 17. Tell me if Peter could say this. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none of And you know, And you get guys that go, well, Paul baptized people in the book of Acts. We know that. We happen to know why. He was provoking the Jew. Right? Paul was told over in Acts chapter 20, 22, I think it was, by Ananias to go be baptized to wash away his sins. I wonder why he was told that. That's what Ananias knew. Right? Paul got further revelation that there's no water baptism in the dispensation of the grace of God needed by anybody, pastor, preacher, pope, anybody else. Right? It's all by the Spirit. He says he didn't, he didn't. Now watch what his fear was. Watch what the Spirit's saying to him. For the preaching of the cross unto them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Paul was worried. The Spirit had Paul concerned about the cross of being none effect. Do you know how many people, when you ask them if they're saved, the first thing that comes out of their mouth, I've been water baptized? That don't mean you're saved. It means you got water baptized, but it don't mean you're saved. Right? So this whole thing, man, what we believe about baptism is the Spirit does the baptism in this dispensation. Right? There's many things that Paul did, many that he did throughout his ministry in Acts until God set that nation aside completely and now Paul's writing what he believes about baptism, right? You see that? Right? He couldn't just go in a synagogue and say, all this law stuff's got to stop right now, I mean it, and you don't know water baptizing, and there's no more speaking in tongues. There. No, he had to get progressive revelation, and he had to give it to them in doses, man, you know, until God had set that nation aside, and now he's just dealing with that body. He's not dealing with the Jew first and all that stuff anymore. He's just dealing with the body now. That Paul said he might provoke some of them to justice, that some of them might be saved. Can you see that? All right, so we got baptism. What was the sixth one we was going to say? What we believe? Um, anybody have it? We believe in two gospels. Well, we actually believe in more than two gospels in the Bible. We know of two that we find. Uh, there's more than one gospel in the Bible. There's not more than one in this dispensation. The only one we have now is Paul's. Look at Galatians chapter 2. And I thank God that the men who preach that there's only one gospel in the Bible, I thank God that they're not in control of my paycheck because they can't count. And they don't need to get into banking because they can't count. So you see two gospels here. There's multiple gospels in the Bible. One gospel for us today. And if any man preaches any other, Paul said, let him be accursed. Right? That means any other than what Paul had been revealed and given to the body of Christ now. So in chapter 2, watch this. Fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now watch. I went up by revelation. Paul wasn't sitting at the Waffle House eating grits and said, I think I'll go up and visit with these guys. Evidently, the Lord felt like it was important for Paul to go up 14 years later and communicate unto them the gospel that he was preaching to the Gentiles. So what? I went up by revelation, communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. Ask yourself a question. If it was the same one they were preaching, why did Paul have to go communicate it to them? That's nonsensical, right? But privately to them which were rep of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now, what gospel do you think they're preaching up there? They're preaching the gospel of circumcision. 
You've got to be circumcised after the manner of Moses, right? That's what they're preaching up there. Paul goes up to say, no, look, folks, <laughs> let me show you something. Let, let, me, let me show you something that God gave me. Let me communicate unto you the gospel that I'm preaching to the Gentile world here. Now watch. And that because a false brother, in other words, brought in whom came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might be, uh, they might bring us back into bondage. What bondage would that be? The law. Circumcision, the law, all that. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul said, we didn't give up on what Christ gave me. We stayed with it, that it might continue with you. Thank God for Paul, man. Thank God he didn't bow down. Thank God the Holy Spirit was in him bold. And that gospel, the grace of God, continued on, and we've got it today. Amen? What? But of these whom seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. For they who soon seemed to be in conference added nothing unto me. Paul said there, the, the law and the circumcision that they were doing, they couldn't add any of that to me. I already knew it. But what's this? But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, gospel number one, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Gospel number two, some reason, people's minds go blank and they can't count. Gospel uncircumcision, gospel circumcision. Did you know there's not two things that can be any more different? You ever notice that? Yeah. Watch. If you take are those two things opposite? Unknown and known? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That means it's not known. That means it's known. Are they different? Yeah. All right. What if you take uncircumcision and then you put circumcision? Are those two things the same? There's obviously more than one gospel in that verse. There, they can't be any more different. Circumcised and uncircumcised, they're just absolutely polar opposite one of the other, right? Is that, is that too simple? Is that, is that too easy to explain it that way? Well, you know what I would do if I saw these two things in one verse? I'd say, well, there's one that's unknown, and there's two that is, that is known. Well, listen, there's one that is, and there's, no, 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 that's two. I would say that there's two Gospels in that verse, one to the uncircumcision, the other one to the circumcision. One was committed unto Paul, that's one. One was, was committed unto Peter, that's two. This is a basic math lesson, and we can't get it right. Look at verse 9. Well, look at verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter, according to that gospel that Peter had, to the, to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward who? The uncircumcised. Right? It's the same God using two men to do two different things. And watch, God's getting ready to stop one of those programs. Watch it. Folks, if you want to know where the Great Commission came to a halt, you're right here on top of it. Do you want to see it? I'll show it to you. Watch this. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of the fellowship, that we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. The Great Commission told them to go to all the world. But right there, God just showed those men that he was now going to work in Paul to the heathen with the gospel of the uncircumcision, the gospel of the grace of God where there is no circumcision. He's going to do that through Paul. And he said that they agreed that they weren't going to go to Rome and they weren't going to go to all these other places. What they were going to do, they were going to go back home to Jerusalem and take care of the circumcision. That's what the Bible says. There's where your great commission came to a halt. It'll happen. It just ain't going to happen today. It's going to happen when God resumes His program with Israel over there, Hebrews through Revelation, the gospel of the kingdom will get preached again. Right? Israel will be lifted up again. Not today. They're fallen. That's what we believe. That's what the Bible says. They're fallen. And through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentile. So there's more than one gospel correctly stated. There is. There's more than two. Right? There was one preached to Abraham. There was one given to Noah. 
The gospel of the kingdom, gospel of circumcision, gospel of the grace of God. They're more than, you know. Well, they're all the same. No, I think not. One was hidden God, given to Paul. All right? What else do we have? Huh? Amen. We believe and rightly divide in the word of truth. You know what they call that? They call us cherry pickers. You will never find a bigger cherry picker than a guy who don't rightly divide the word of truth. That's all he can do. I'm in Matthew 5. That's me. I'm in Matthew word of some wrath. That ain't me. That's cherry picking. Right? I'm over there where the blessings are flowing. Hallelujah, that's us. I'm over there where the fire's coming down. Whoa, that ain't me. That's the cherry picker. Yeah. Right? You'll never find more. They pick cherries quicker than you can in an hour at church on Sunday morning than you could in a lifetime. Yeah. Cherry pickers, man. And they'll put, point their finger to you and say, you're a cherry picker. Yeah. No, I'm not a cherry picker. What do I do? I choose to understand, and I'm not so narcissistic that I believe all the Bible's about me. Yeah. Amen? It ain't about none of us. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about God Almighty's perfect plan to restore heaven and earth unto Himself. And He's going to do that through two different agencies. One called Israel and the earth, and the other in the body of Christ in heaven. Amen? So go to 2 Timothy. Saw one sitting behind a desk the other day, brought out that dispensationals, they go through the Bible, and they start making all these divisions in the Bible, and they said there ain't but two, and that's the old covenant and the new covenant. Well, he's not right to divide the word of truth. Right? He's confused. Look at 2 Timothy 2.15. I saw some little skinny, uh, skinny jean preacher, pants so tight that he couldn't breathe, talking about that's ain't what this means, and it don't even say that. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right to divide in the word of truth. You see that? He says study, gives you something to do. He gives you why? To show yourself approved unto God, to be a workman. So that you're not ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, what does that mean? All the Bible's truth, right? That means it has to be divided. And God made the divisions. We don't make those divisions for ourselves. We honor where God made the divisions, right? You ever notice how the Bible's laid out? You ever notice, really? Look at it. It makes perfect sense. You got the Old Testament and God's given the prophets to Israel. You come into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's confirming the promises made unto the fathers. You come to Acts, and you see it starts with the Jews, it ends with the Gentiles. Whew, wonder what happened. Romans is a Gentile book. The next 12 books following Romans are written to who? The body of Christ. Then God says, those people are so dumb, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write Hebrews on the next page of the next dispensation, and they're still going to get it wrong. He said, I'll flag the first book that Paul writes and I'll call it Romans, a Gentile name. Right? And he says, I'm going to name the next section of the book Hebrews. And I'll bet you those Romans will go over there and make themselves part of Hebrews. That's just how they are. They, they reject my word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They won't believe me. Well, what if they don't believe? Does it make the promises of God without effect? No. Let God be true, but every man a liar. I don't, hey, I can't help if a man today wants to make himself a Hebrew. If he wants to put himself over there where the doctrine changes, and if he turns away, he can't come back. I can't help that if that's what he wants to do. If he forsakes the assembling together himself, that's not Wednesday night prayer meeting. That's leaving that little flock. Don't fail to assemble little flocks, what he's telling them in Hebrews. So what do we believe? We believe that you're right to divide the word of truth. You make the divisions where God made the, the divisions. Well, do you ever cross your mind that all of a sudden you're reading the Bible and this guy pops up out of nowhere and he wrote 13 books? By volume, he wrote 13 books. That ought to, that ought to make you stop and go, red flag. 
What's going on here? If you'll get into those 13 books, you'll find out who God made you. Right? So yes, rightly divide the word of truth. If you can rightly divide it, it means you could also what? Wrongly divide. How would you wrongly divide it? Say there's only two pieces, the old covenant and the new covenant, in which you're in neither. Find me your name in the new covenant. It'll come to pass, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Which one do you belong to? Now, uh, you were not a people. He didn't make you a covenant promise. He gave you His grace. You understand? He could do that without a covenant. All right? Well, we've got to be part of it. All right? So that's what we believe. We believe salvation is in Christ, His finished cross work, faith in that, trust in that, that alone, nothing else. We believe that Paul is our apostle, sent unto us a chosen vessel of God to give unto us a dispensation and the grace of God that was never known before Paul, given unto him the revelation of the mystery. We believe in the one new man, which is the body of Christ, where there's no Jew, there's no Greek, we're all one in that body today. That's what God is building to fill up the heavens. We believe we're sealed unto the day of redemption. We believe that the baptism is by the Spirit and not by the preacher, pastor, pope, or whoever. Right? We believe that there's more than one gospel in the Bible. It's important to see Paul's gospel. Galatians 1, 6. You better look at it. Get it down right. Find it in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And we believe that you have to rightly divide the word of truth to understand that God in interrupted the prophecy program and gave a mystery dispensation in which nobody knew before revealed to Paul. And that's what he's been doing for 2,000 years. And the church world has been rejecting it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Did you hear what I said? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Go to Ephesians 3, and that's where we're going to finish. I want everybody in here, if you will, and if you don't mind, they can't see you on camera. They just get me up here with my antics. I'm going to ask you a question. If you don't mind, just sneak up your hand and say, yeah, I'm not going to ask you to bow your head and start thinking about stuff, I mean, like they do in regular church. I'm just going to ask you a question. Look in chapter 3 and verse 1. Remember the word I use here. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What's this? For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you who? If you have heard, right? If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, or how did my revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Watch, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same nation. Not what it says, is it? And of the same body. And partakers of his promise in Christ by what? What gospel, Paul? The one that was given to Paul. Now go back up and look at 3, 1, and 2 with me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of, you, of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard, how many of you had heard about the dispensation of the grace of God before you came to write division? I never had. I never had. I never heard anybody preach on the dispensation of the grace of God, what it meant, who it was to, what it was for, and never had any understanding of the dispensation of the grace of God. I didn't. Until about eight to ten years ago when I got down into that and started reading it. And that's the very chapter that opened my eyes that I'd been lied to all my life. It had been hid from me all my life. That's the very chapter, one morning before work, I'm reading that. And that's where the chains came off, brother. That's where the chains come off. That morning forward, my life has never been the same. I have now heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. And in that dispensation of the grace of God... God gave a special man, a special revelation to deliver unto you and I that dispensation. The dispensing of God's grace. A time when God is not dispensing judgment. He's not dispensing wrath. He's not dispensing his fury upon you. But he is dispensing nothing but his grace. And he gets rejected all around you because man cannot live on grace alone. He has to have something to go with it. 
But I don't believe that. I believe that God gave Paul the dispensation of grace of God. And I believe there was grace in the Bible before Paul. But there was not a dispensation of grace in the Bible before Paul. That's what I believe. All right? So in capping it off this morning, we didn't get everything done I wanted to do, but thank you, those who participated. The rest of you, get right. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but listen, we're not wrong. We're not participating in some cult. What you came out of is way closer to a cult than what you're in, I promise you that. They're the ones trying to have dominion over your faith tell you where you can go, what you wear, what you eat, how you spend your money, and you better give it to them first, and they'll say you're giving it to God, and I don't think God needs it. Right? God ain't sitting up in heaven wondering how he's going to get groceries, folks. That's just to get your money given unto them. There's no priesthood to support today. We don't tithe to a priesthood. We give as God has purposed in our heart to give. You with me? That's what we believe, man. And we believe it because it comes out of here. And it's not just biblical, but it's dispensational. Let me say this. They can fight everything that we just said with the Bible. You know why? Because tithing, the law, water baptism, Peter, James, John, all those people are in the Bible. That's biblical. What they teach is biblical. But it's not dispensational, and that's the most dangerous doctrine that you can get. Bible doctrine without making the division where God made the division. And the next thing you know, you're over here somewhere practicing something that doesn't pertain to you. Right? All right, with that being said, let us pray and then uh, we'll, we'll discuss anything that you might have a question on afterwards. Father, we're so grateful for this day, another day of fellowship in the Word of God. Thankful, Lord, that we're able to come together and um, Look at the Word of God, understand who we are in the Word of God, where we can be found in the Word of God, and your plan for us in the Word of God for all the ages. In the loving name that's above every name, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we give you all the praise, all the thanks, all the honor, and all the glory. And everyone did say, Amen. Amen.